Good morning, everyone. Sherry is running a little late this morning, so we're going to get started. And uh, I have a few announcements uh, to share with you this morning. Uh, this week is Vacation Bible School, uh, 5.30 to 8 p.m., Monday through Friday. Um, kids kindergarten through sixth grade. So if you, if you know of anybody that has, does not know about this, uh, encourage them to come down. They're going to be on the case helping to uncover the mysteries of the parables of Jesus. Uh, so please uh, get the word out even this late. Uh, it doesn't hurt. Um, normal events going on through the week. Um, Barb Seaton said that there is a family-friendly theater, uh, Rock and Robin Hood, next weekend at the uh, Rome Community Theater, Thursday through Sunday. Um, look for announcements. Are you going to ask Barb, wherever she happens to be here? So where she is. Um, and also, as well, uh, the performance of Matilda is going on at Adirondack High School next weekend as well, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Um, let's see. Howard would like to thank everyone who turned out for the ham dinner, volunteers, as well as diners. They had a very successful time for that. Um, so, again, thank you for anyone who volunteered or actually came down to eat. Because um, I wasn't volunteering, I was doing something else that evening. But uh, I was able to get a takeout dinner, and the food was very good. So I uh, appreciate the effort that went into that. Um, August the 27th, we have been uh, graciously blessed with Peter performing for us for a number of weeks, months, not quite years, but we're close. Um, and we're going to celebrate Peter's time with us on August 27th. Uh, we've hired a new organist who's going to be starting after that. But to celebrate the, the effort that Peter has put into this uh, uh, musical musical program here at church. We would like to honor him with a get together on the 27th. So please mark your calendars. I'll be right after church on the 27th. Uh, and I believe that's all of the announcements that I have this morning. I have a number of uh, joys and concerns to pass along. Uh, Clara Washburn passed on, on that her brother-in-law Harry Washburn uh, did pass away Thursday. Uh, he was the last of the six Washburn brothers. Uh, so uh, prayers for that entire family in their loss. Um, Kimmy would like prayers for her daughter, uh, herself, and her entire family for health concerns. Uh, Bob uh, Dietrich said that Ruth is home recuperating from her last hospitalization. Uh, continued prayers for her for this recuperation as she get, gets better. Um, John King uh, would like to raise uh, Marilyn Bauman again for her health concerns. Uh, please keep her in your prayers. And Rich Hartz uh, would like to raise prayers for Renee, his daughter Renee, for health concerns that she is facing, and also for Teresa's daughter Melissa for some health concerns there. And I think that is all of the joys and concerns that I have for this morning. Uh, let us continue with our prayer.
Let us join together in our uh, response of reading. You may rise if, rise if you are able. This is a statement of faith of the Korean Methodist Church. Let us profess together. We believe in the one God, creator and sustainer of all things, father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and in grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God, contained in the Old and New Testaments, as a sufficient rule both of faith and of practice. We believe in the Church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as a divine will realized in human society and in the family of God where we are all brothers and sisters. We believe in the final triumph of righteousness and in the life everlasting. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is number 57, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. Let us now join together in our unison prayer. Let us pray. Merciful God, full of grace, we rejoice in our salvation. We humbly come before you, knowing that only you can save. Through Jesus Christ, break the chains of sin that have bound us. We repent of everything that is not of you and seek to live as your holy vessels transformed by the power of your name. God, break through and open doors to new hopes and possibilities for our church and in our own lives. We surrender our wills to you and faithfully follow into the new and unknown future. May your will be done. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord, and I'd love to hear from you today. How have you experienced God, encountered God, heard from God, been led by God this past week? How has God moved in your life? Oh, we're here. I just want to thank everyone again for Pioneer Ham Dinner and how everything turned out. Uh, Chris Whitmore was our cook, and it really touched him, I think, how our congregation really supported the dinner and all the helpers that 
that come and it was just great. And I know it reached a lot of people, just the, the fellowship and the support that we give each other. Kim and I were, Kim Larson and I were on the dishwasher and mm -hmm. she was a great help and everyone just uh, really pitched in. and It was great, thank yeah. you. So we experience God when we're serving together, when we're a unified force together and people experience God's grace when they witness our togetherness in that too. Yeah, anyone else want to share? That's Kimmy. Five people walk from my house to my mom, Peter's mom, Thanksgiving. Wow. Yeah. Yes, and you're without walking you're without the braces. She is walking without the braces, walking extraordinarily well. God is good. Yes, Tess. Yesterday, Phil Rommelstein, my significant other's family, gathered at Lake Delta for a beautiful day. There were like 27 of us from 80-something down to two years, I believe. It was just awesome. And so uh, the way it had all touched me is that here we are out in nature. God provided. Everybody got there safely. Everybody got home safely. And we just had such a wonderful time together. It just went by too fast. That was all <laughs> Family is so important, and to share the love and fellowship that we had is definitely God's hand is in that. Amen. Amen. Anyone else want to share? I want to share it for those that didn't see it last week. Chris, uh, the man that comes in the wheelchair, painted me a picture. It's beautiful. It's in my office. I'm going to figure out where to hang it. Um, and and it's just I was moved that he was. He would do that, just to, to the sincerity and giving. It's just, um, I've experienced God's grace through that, through people who give with love. Anyone else want to share? Well, we have an opportunity to give back to God. Oh, I wanted to share, actually, people have been asking about our roots. <laughs> um, we have so far raised $27,010 toward our roof project, which means that we've also matched the um, grant. So we've got $8,000 toward that. So we're up to what, doing mathing on the fly, $35,010. And um, we have um, Jean, God bless her, sending out things to the area churches um, to, to see if they would be moved to give as well. And I ask you to fervently, first fervently pray, if you've not given yet, pray about it. I really do ask you to pray about that. And um, we have been notified that we are up for consideration with the Rome Community Foundation. And so pray, <laughs> pray hard, um, hoping that, um, that we will be chosen, but um, pray about that as well. And um, for however God moves to continue to spread the word for that. So God is good. God is, God is answering the prayers. You know, God is really answering prayers all the time. So in response, with gratitude, we give back our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. We give back a blessing of God because God has so richly blessed us.
abundant grace that you have so freely and lovingly poured out into our lives. We pray that you will receive these gifts that we give. A response of gratitude to you, Lord, that you would receive them and bless them, that they would go out and spread your good news, that this money would fuel and fund things that reach people's lives for the transformation of the world, making Jesus' disciples in his holy name. Amen. Please be seated. Are there any kids that want to come up? Any kids that want to come up? Hey, husband, how are you? It's just you today. Yeah. You doing well? Yeah. Is it an incident you want on the microphone? No. Yesterday, I was on, I was at the movies with for one of my, for one of my friend's big brother, and we went to an, we went to an ice cream shop, and they, they had like a bunch of trees. I tripped and fell on a road. My wagon. Oh, so you got hurt. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. Yeah. So you were with friends when this happened? Yeah. Did they take care of you? And make sure you were okay? Yeah. Your friend's mom? Somebody was there, right? Yeah. 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 I want to talk. It was good to have that relationship there, right? To have somebody there for you. It was talking about relationships today. So um, if you wanted to build a relationship with someone, whether with family or with friends or something like that, how do you think you would go about doing it? You have to like build up the trust so that they will so that they'll trust you. Right? Okay. They'll trust you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some things you could do to to build trust and to build relationships? What do you think that you can do? If they get hurt, I can ask them if they need any help. Right. Okay. So you could be there for them if they if they're in trouble in some way, right? Um I could cheer them up when they're sad. Yeah, you could yeah, absolutely. That would be a really good friend, wouldn't it? I could ask them if they wanted to play. Oh, yeah, so they could spend some time together and do fun things together, right? Yeah, all that kind of stuff. There's so much more. You know, the God wants us to have a relationship with him, too. And so there's things we can do to build that relationship. Can you think of anything that we might be able to do to build a relationship with God? Pray, pray. to God every day. Yep, that's always a good thing, yeah. We're going to be talking about all the different ways that we can build that relationship, all the different things we can do. But we want to make sure that we do that because building a relationship with God is really important, isn't it? Yeah, we want to make sure that we have God with us in a really deep and powerful way all the time, right? Close relationship with God. Yeah. Do you have anything you want to uh, you want to share? Anything you're thankful for? I'm thankful for everything that's happened so far in my life because that makes me me. Makes you you, and you are thankful for you. That's good. Yeah. All righty. So let's pray. You're going to repeat after me, okay? Dear God, thank you for making me me, for being with me in my life and loving me so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. This morning's scripture lesson comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, 
slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you have a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs with the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jeff. So we are in a sermon series about Methodism, exploring our Methodist roots, what we as Methodists believe and how that informs our practices. And as I've said before, I love the doctrine and practices of Methodists, and that's why I'm a Methodist today. But did you know that the term Methodist was actually a derogatory term when it was first used? So John Wesley and his brother Charles, along with several others, were committed to their faith, following Jesus and growing to become more and more like Jesus, just like the scriptures say. And at Oxford University, in their zeal for Jesus, they formed a holy club where people would gather to increase in godly devotion and practice their faith together with methods for growing closer to God. And so people would make fun of them, calling them methods because of the methods. And so Methodist, the term, stuck. So the methods of practice were taken right from Scripture that, that describes the means of grace. Grace that is the undeserved, unmerited favor from God. It's God's love and power. It's God's gift. It's God's presence stepping into our need. Means as in a way to grow in grace, to grow deeper and stronger, more into Christ's likeness as a disciple of Jesus Christ. See, in the Great Commission, Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So Jesus didn't call us to go and make converts. He called us to go and make disciples, people who follow Jesus Christ and are transformed by grace. So our mission statement of the Methodist Church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. One soul at a time, transformed and transforming. So there's a picture that will show that there are two different categories for the means of grace. Works of mercy, which we'll discuss next week, and works of piety. Piety. I mean, what do you think of when you hear the word piety? So in, in preparation for this sermon, I actually asked around and I got things such as, I have no idea what that means, <laughs> to I'm not sure, but I know it's not good. And I had one person say, oh, I, I think that just means holier than thou and stuffy and judgmental, which is not true. Um, think, think of works of piety as meaning acts of worship and devotion in order to draw closer to God. It's, it's to grow in holiness, becoming sanctified, leading toward entire sanctification, Christian perfection, perfect in God's love. That ongoing journey of every believer as we are moving on to perfection. So verse 1 speaks about this and says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. It's a reorienting of our lives, hearts and minds shifting off of the earthly things and onto things above, heavenly things. Setting our hearts and our minds on God leads to change within. So works of piety 
as a means of grace, are not works to earn our salvation. We are already saved by grace through faith alone. But they are acts or works to work out our salvation, growing in sanctification, in godliness, in God's love within ourselves. And in the process, as it says in verse 5, it put to death whatever belongs to our earthly nature, our earthly nature that determines to sin. All sin is idolatry, making ourselves God. When we choose ourselves over our own earthly, fleshly desires, over God. You got to ask, and why do we do that? I mean, sometimes, if we're honest, we choose to sin because we like it. it makes us feel good, and we don't want to give it up. It's rebellion, willful disobedience. And that choice binds us and harms us, whether we recognize it or not. But sometimes we recognize it's a sin. And we want to change, but we have not yet experienced the power of God's grace to break those chains. The means of grace gives us practices to grow in that grace that empowers us to put to death our earthly nature, take off the old self, put on the new self in Christ. It's basically the first part of what Jesus described as the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart soul, mind, and strength. And when we do that, we experience more grace, deeper, stronger grace, grace that transforms us from the inside out. John Wesley described the transformation as holiness of heart and life, which means God's love filling our heart and then leading our lives. And all of this is in response to God's love for us. So grace is needed to conquer the sin in our lives. If we try to just do it on our own, by our own will, we are going to fail. Grace is absolutely needed. And especially grace is needed when we take that and overcome that sin and replace it with something godly. Verses 12 through 14 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion instead of judgment, kindness, instead of indifference or hatred or cruelty, humility, instead of pride and self-centeredness, gentleness, instead of harshness, patience, instead of impatience and unrealistic expectations, bear with one another, instead of cutting off or gossiping or slandering or being bitter and nasty, and forgive one another if you have any grievance against someone, Forgive as the Lord forgave you, instead of holding a grudge, allowing unforgiveness to harm. And it says, over all these virtues, put on love. Over it all, put on love. The grace that comes from God. And none of this just happens. It happens through grace. When it says, you once were, you used to walk in these ways with your old self, but now you are raised with Christ. Now you have put on the new self. All of that is a choice that we make to accept and live into God's grace. God doesn't call us to just simply sit by, idly waiting for God's grace to, poof, instantaneous transformation. Like all those makeover shows, you know, the before and after, without showing all the ways, the many trials and choices and struggles. It's never just poof. The same is true with sanctification. Growing deeper with God, growing more like God. Engaging in the means of grace are ways God works within us so that God's grace permeates and pervades through us all the time. So we want God's favor, presence, forgiveness, guidance, blessing, and power. We want, in fact, we need God's grace. Amen? So what are the means of grace through works of piety? Well, individual practices are, for instance, reading about the faith, devotionals, theology, stories of faith, 
informing and inspiring. So we have the upper room and the daily bread devotionals. We have a library full of books that you can take out and read. You could watch faith-based programming. And consider what you are filling your mind with that impacts your heart, that impacts your life. Garbage in, garbage out. Love in, love out. A means of grace. How many have read or watched something faith-based and experienced God's grace? Testimony time here, guys. Seriously, raise your hands. It's also prayerfully studying and meditating on the scriptures. God's holy book of love written for us. It's not enough to know, just know the gist of what the Bible says. As it says in Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and actions and attitudes of the heart. Meaning that the scriptures, when read and reflected upon with prayer, infused with the Holy Spirit, will speak into your heart and mind and fill you with grace. The words returning, the feeling and knowing that came from those words, revealing and grace restoring as we go through our day, a means of God's grace. So how many have read the Bible and experienced God's grace? Another work of piety is individual worship. Practicing, noticing, and acknowledging God. Practicing, praising God throughout the day. Living a life of gratitude. Recognizing God's presence with us and being thankful. So we can sing Christian songs, listen to Christian teaching, sermons, reflections. Daily worship as a work of piety to draw us closer to God. A means of grace. So how many have worshipped throughout the day and experienced God's grace? Yeah, I have a Christian playlist I use, and I listen, and I sing, and I am reminded, and I am filled, and experience God's grace. But here's one. Fasting. <laughs> Going without food. Jesus and his disciples fasted. The early church fasted. John Wesley and the Holy Club fasted every Wednesday and every Friday. So we could, as a means of grace, go without food food for a time. And every time we're hungry, fill it, fill that hunger with God. Or we could fast from something we know is unhealthy for us. So if it's unhealthy for us, it wouldn't be wise to return to it. Or we could fast from something that is distracting us from God until God's grace breaks that stronghold and puts it in the right place in our lives. Fasting as a means of grace. How many have fasted from food or something else and experienced God's grace? Oh, we got to get some fasting going on around here. So then along with fasting is healthy living. Healthy choices not only make us feel better, but physical health affects our mental health and our spiritual health. Rest, exercise, healthy eating, and stopping all the things that are not healthy. We know what those are. And the Holy Spirit may have even just brought something to mind for you right now. Healthy living. We do it to respect and honor our bodies because as it says in 1 Corinthians 6.19, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in us. So how many have chosen to live in a healthier way and experience God's grace? And of course, praying is a means of grace, a work of piety. Scripture instructs us to pray often, pray without ceasing, be alert and persistent in prayer, consistent, persistent communication with God, speaking to God and listening for God, praying thanksgiving and praise, but also praying for wisdom and guidance, direction, leading, strength, protection, healing, and so much more. And in trust, placing everything into God's hands and in trust following wherever and however God leads. A means of grace. 
How many have prayed and experienced God's breakthrough, prayed and heard God, prayed and experienced God's powerful grace? Yeah. And then sharing our faith with others, knowing our faith story and witnessing to others about how God is moving in our life is another means of grace. And when we say yes and choose to do that, we may experience grace and a deepening of relationship with God. So how many have shared about their faith walk, their relationship with God, and experienced God's grace? Yeah. These are all practices, methods, as a means of grace for us to do individually. And many, unfortunately, if they do it at all, stop there. Assuming that faith and growth is a private, solitary practice. But solitary religion is never practiced or endorsed in Scripture or in the early church. Jesus and the disciples were together as a community, as a faith family, learning and growing together. And this was the model for the early church and a model for early Methodists and a model that we still follow today because it's important, especially in America where we have a tendency to believe in me and my God and that there's no need for the church. I could just do it on my own. We just think it's okay to just have a solitary faith, but that's just not true. John Wesley believed that solitary religion is directly the opposite of the gospel of Christ. He wrote, holy solitary is a phrase no more consistent with the gospel than holy adulterers. The gospel of Christ knows of no religion but social, no holiness but social holiness. And by social holiness, he meant that we are in this together, that it is necessary to work out our salvation and participate in the means of grace in community with other believers. Participating on our own is good, absolutely beneficial. It fills the time between being together. But isolated faith can be dangerous with no accountability. And isolated faith can be lonely and weak. The body of Christ needed for relationship and discernment and strength and accountability, being there for and with one another. So there are communal means of grace, works of piety that are done in community. And one is worship, what we're doing right now. Beyond living worship as a daily walk, engaging in worship together is a means of grace. Scripture, sermon, song, prayer, together. God is relational, and we are created to be relational. Worshiping together reminds us that we are not in this faith journey alone. Hearing the God moments builds up our faith, and our engagement in worship encourages others to engage. And so much more as the power of the Holy Spirit pours out grace. How many have engaged in worship and experienced God's grace? Yeah, and along with worship is partaking in communion, the holy sacrament offered as a means of grace, responded to in humility, repentance, and knowing victory in Christ as we remember Jesus' mighty acts of salvation. So how many have received communion and experienced God's grace? And then reading the Bible is important on our own, but also in community. We hear different perspectives, gain wisdom and life application. I mean, truly, many have no idea what the Bible actually says. God is made in their own image. The directives of Scripture are instead determined by our own desires. Reading, knowing, and discussing Scriptures with others leads to growing deeper in our relationship with God, a means of grace. It's why we offer Bible studies. How many have participated in a Bible study and experienced God's grace? So I try to make Bible study not just about information, but about life application. Because a key focus in Methodism is discipleship that is not just information-driven, knowing about God, but transformation-driven, inspiring life change by grace. And Wesley determined that one of the key methods as a means of grace was through small covenant groups, class meetings and band meetings. 
And these groups met together consistently over an extended period of time. And in community, they sought God's presence and power and practiced practice cultivating growth and holiness through conversations about their experience of God. The groups were started, honestly, by necessity, but then the incredible benefits of it became known. Wesley wrote about it, saying, it can scarce be conceived what advantages have been reaped from this little prudential regulation. Many now happily experienced that Christian fellowship of which they had not so much an idea before. They began to bear one another's burdens and to naturally care for one another. They had a more endeared affection for each other and speaking the truth in love, they grew up in Christ and increased unto the edifying of itself in love. You see, we need each other to grow in our love of God. So the class meeting was between seven to 12 people, often men and women together, and they would ask one another, how is it with your soul? Or how does your soul prosper? So it's introspective with an expectation of prospering, of thriving through grace. And the participants became more sensitive to God's presence and work in their lives, began actively experiencing God and receiving God's grace. Gathering and sharing in that way empowered people to grow with God and one another. And the more they shared about God in their lives, the more they spoke the truth and love and spoke effectively into one another's lives, the more they grew in grace and love and holiness. It was actually an expectation of early Methodists that everyone would attend a class meeting weekly for a weekly check-in and check-up. There was accountability with it. People needed to be there, and because it was so powerful, people wanted to be there. Participation included humility and vulnerability, a willingness to share openly and honestly, and others would support and encourage in that safe place. Participation was actually mandatory. So our life groups are patterned after this, and though it's not mandatory, we really want to encourage you, encourage you all to participate when we launch the groups again in the fall. How many have participated in a small group and experienced God's grace? Yeah, it's powerful. And then the next level was voluntary, but really powerful. The band meeting. And the band meeting was three to five people, the same gender and marital status, and the people were earnestly desiring to grow even deeper with even greater holiness, which required honest inward examination and piercing conversation because the band meeting was centered around confession of sin. They would literally ask one another, what sins have you committed since our last meeting? Ooh. And people would openly share. I mean, the question was not for judgment or shame or guilt, but for growth in grace and holiness. So as a church, we don't have anything like that in place yet. But if you are sincerely interested in that, let me know. So the means of grace are ways for us to grow in grace, to become who God created us to be. Verses 9 through 10 says, You have taken off your old self with its practices and put on the new self. And too many hold on to the old self. Many are either not inspired to change or don't believe it's possible. And people will just say, oh, that's just who I am, or even, that's just the way God made me to be, in reference to things that are not of God. Paul lists some of the sins that the church had been struggling with, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, and notes that now that they have conquered those, it's time to start focusing on some others. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language, lying. And there are many more lists in the Bible to the point where it may seem overwhelming and impossible. It may seem powerless in the face of all that. 
But what seems impossible is possible because all things are possible through Christ. Amen? So our opening hymn was written by Charles Wesley, John's brother. And on page 58 of the hymnal, it gives even more verses that speaks to this. The one verse that we sang is just one of my so powerful verse. It says, he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean. His blood avails for me. But then he goes on and says, harlots and publicans and thieves in holy triumph join. Saved is the sinner that believes from crimes as great as mine. Murderers and all ye hellish crew, ye sons of lust and pride, believe a Savior died for you. For me, the Savior died. So it doesn't matter what it is, what we have struggled with, what we're wrestling with now, it's time to be set free. The grace of Jesus Christ conquered sin for us. The power of sin was canceled by the cross. We have been raised with Christ, raised victorious as Christ was victorious. And we can, through grace, be victorious and experience freedom and transformation in Christ. We can be conquerors over sin. The chains of sin that hold people in bondage is broken through the amazing grace of Christ. So we want more grace, amen? Grace that comes through relationship with God, the means of grace available to all. So I want to ask all of you some questions. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the farthest and 10 being the closest you have ever felt to God, what number would you give to how close you feel to God today? How is it with your soul? How does your soul prosper? What is God calling you to do about it? What sins have you committed this past week? Are you willing to take whatever next step or steps God is leading you to? Are you willing to put yourself fully into God's hands? Wesley wrote a covenant prayer that does just that. So let us pray together. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee. Exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O oh glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thou art mine and I am thine. So be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth let it be ratified in heaven. Amen. Piety. It's not a bad word. It's actually a powerful practice. God's grace transforms us from the inside out. Through the grace of Christ, together we are moving on to perfection. The chains that have bound us broken by grace. Lives made new as we've been set free. The stories of our faith walk on our hearts, our transformation shining brightly. Old self is gone, new self is here with God's amazing grace. Amen? Amen. I'd like to invite you all to stand if you're able as we sing together. Amazing grace. My chains are gone.
Let us pray. Holy and loving God, God of grace and mercy, we come before you bearing all of ourselves to you. We pray that in this time that you would fill us with your grace to lead us by your will, to empower us to live as you have called us to live. Lord, break any chains that are binding us. Tear down any strongholds that are blocking us. Break through and break us free. Lord, we pray that you would bring healing to us as we struggle with the things of, in this earthly life, as we struggle with our flesh, as we struggle with all of the pain and the difficulties and the sorrows of life. Bring healing, Lord. Lord, we pray that you bring healing into our lives, touching our hearts and our minds and our spirits. Lift us up and encourage us. Empower us, Lord. Touch us with your healing presence and bring healing to others who are hurting and struggling. We pray for healing in people's bodies as they're experiencing pain and disease. Continue to fuel their bodies in recovery, to touch them with your healing anointing, to set the body free back to how you created it to be. Bring healing, Lord, for the people who are hurting. Lord, we pray for healing in people's minds as they struggle with doubt and confusion and anger as they struggle with having their mind bound by the things of this earth, we pray that you would break through. And give us all, Lord, the mind of Christ. Bring healing to the mind that suffers with anxiety and depression. And speak your truth to them in love that lifts up their mind in your heavenly places, reveals to them who they are and how much they're loved. Bring your peace, Lord. And put a blanket of protection around us. As the flaming arrows of the enemy come toward us, speaking lies, leading us toward things that are not of you, we pray for your protection to keep us on your path. Lead us, Lord, in your way. Lead us to speak your truth in love, to bear love, in this world toward others, to speak about our faith openly and boldly, to share your gospel message with those who don't yet know you. Lord, show us your way. Lord, we pray that you continue to move within this church to fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit to make decisions that honor you that we would glorify you by the choices we make as a congregation, bind this church together as a faith family fully committed to you. Grow us, Lord, in your grace through you and with one another. Grow this congregation, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you would lead us that all the decisions that we make in our lives, that they would be honoring to you. And we know that we've not always done this. So hear our prayer of confession as the people of God repeat after me. Lord, I have sinned. I've not always been loving. I've not always followed you. Forgive me, Lord. Set me on your path. Lead me in your love and in your righteousness through Christ. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen.
So hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners, and this proves God's love for you and for me. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And so we have an opportunity to experience, partake in a means of grace offered to all of us. If you're seeking after Christ in your life, if you're seeking after grace, you are welcome at the table. It's open and available to all. And that page is right over here. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophet. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you. And blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, all of you. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup. He gave it to his disciples after thanking God and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink from this often remembering me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as confident children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Will those who are serving please come forward?
now you are all welcome to come to the table of grace. And Beth will be up here to pray. If you have anything you want to be prayed for, prayer is another means of grace. It's what we're here for together, right? So come forward, receive, and partake.
to go in the grace that breaks those chains, the power of Jesus Christ our Lord. And go in that grace and shine that grace with others. The rail will continue to be open for anyone who would like prayer. And go and have gatherings, share grace with others. 